it's nefarious, man. Like the brain works in fucked up ways. The mind is one of the most deceiving, manipulative pieces of equipment, flesh, the human bodies on earth. I never have trusted my brain. All of that weight lives in your head. And you are the decision maker. Psychology of entrepreneurship. Hi. It's Ronsley. If this is your first volume, welcome. This is a weekly series where I go inside the mind of an entrepreneur, artist, athlete, academic to decipher what is the psychology of our decisions. Times are strange. We have been self-isolating for over a month now and I don't know about you, but there are days that are good and there are days that are bad. And in our next volume, we break down self-isolation and the myths around it, just like we did misinformation a few weeks ago. But it's been interesting to see how the people around me have been adapting to this new lifestyle where we are confined to the parameters of our homes. With many of us finding comfort in whatever makes us happy, whether it be exercise, creating art, baking, alcohol, or just us having time to ourselves. Everyone is trying to cope in their own way. For me, I've been controlling a lot of my day so that the parts that are haywire happen in small bursts. What do I mean by that? Well, I heard this saying that's attributed to a Navy SEAL about how in times of a crisis, we perform at the level of our practice. So whatever our practice levels are is what we are left to work with. Uh, when things go haywire. So I've been practicing yoga, meditation, running, thinking, interviewing, creating. What about you? How have you been dealing with self-isolation? For some of us, this transition has been okay. For others, this sudden shift in routine means a loss of income, a loss of homes, loss of stability, a decline in mental health. Everyone's experience is different, but we all share the uncertainty of what happens next. So, for this addendum, I decided to reach out to my good friend, Dr. Sherry Walling, who you might remember from volume two. Being a clinical psychologist who works with leaders, I wanted to pick a brain about how we as entrepreneurs can respond to this situation in a way that would actually benefit us. And I don't mean how we can use this time to be more productive, but how we can deal with our feelings and, if anything, forgive ourselves when we just can't bring ourselves to be productive. As entrepreneurs and creatives, we can be hard on ourselves for slacking off. We put in the extra hours, we push ourselves outside our comfort zones, we plan and we plan and then we plan some more. We do it because we are passionate about what we do. But how do we cope when life steps on our plans? How do we cope when life punches us in the face? Well, I'll let Sherry answer that one. I thought this would be a cool conversation primarily because, first of all, entrepreneurs have been punched in the face before right? Mm -hmm. We've come from this line of being punched in the face and then being okay with it and getting back up and all that kind of stuff. And a lot of the world is being punched in the face for the first time. However, there are some entrepreneurs that are going through different emotions and you see this so often uh, and you work with entrepreneurs, especially and high performing people on a regular basis. But I suppose in one way or the other, people are performing to the best of their ability. But how when something like this comes, there's a, there's a sense of normalcy bias, like, you know, planes crashing, everything's going to be fine. Everything's going to be normal. Like how much of those sort of attitudes are we taking when we process something like COVID coming through the whole planet? Well, I can tell you what I've observed, which is not always what I think is most helpful, <laughs> but I think, um, as is often the case in human experience, we're sort of drawn to one end of the spectrum or the other. And on one end of the spectrum, I think it's the business as usual folks. So this might be the entrepreneurs among us whose businesses haven't yet directly been affected, which is hard to imagine, but there are certainly some. Or the this is just another hurdle, this is just another hiccup, like march forward, keep going. 
And then on the other end of the spectrum, I think there's almost the, the sky is falling folks. And maybe that's even not a good characterization because for many people, like their businesses are imploding. So it's not a chicken little like situation. It's that like, it's a really dire immediate effects felt and you're sort of sitting in a mess. And then of course there's people in the middle of the spectrum. So I think we're watching people react and trying to cope with how to respond to chaos. And on kind of the spectrum of human reaction, most often we try to counterbalance chaos with rigidity, with like hyper attention to control. I think that this is inviting even the those of us who are really often in control of our lives to kind of ride in the middle, right? To ride the waves, to tolerate the fact that we are living in a situation which is not very controllable and our best attempts at rigidity, whether we're hoarding toilet paper or not, are often um, sort of ill-fated. Like we, it's just too big. That is so fascinating. So you're saying that, I love that, how hypertension of control. Like, you know, when, where do we get that from? The idea that control will make things okay. Like if we have a sense of control, because uh, even that can be changed, the meaning around that. Con it. Yeah. And, and you know, control is not a bad thing, right? We all mm-hmm. strive to be in control of our bodies and control of our minds to have some ability to at least exert influence over our emotional state. So I don't villainize control, but when we see the total absence of control, we're in chaos. When we see the total craving for control, we're in rigidity and both are problematic from a human psyche perspective. So obviously there's an explanation for the holding of toilet rolls um, and, and, and all that kind of stuff. But um, I have, I suppose, oh, we all have the, the opportunity to talk with people from around the planet and different people are affected in, in different ways. And mm-hmm. it's fascinating because I was there not long ago uh, in New York on the 12th of March and and I spoke, actually, actually, I got a message from Alda, Alda Karen. And yeah. she was saying that they are pulling power from her building to power the trucks for the bodies because there's no place in the morgue. Mm. And how does one process things like this? Because this is probably the first time, you know, the, that, uh, the first world is probably seeing something like that. I think it's hard to grasp. You know, I think a lot of people are struggling to grasp what's happening and can either get sort of pulled into distraction or are compulsively like taking in news, trying to let it sink in and then trying to know how do you respond to something like this? And I think this is even a, a place in the conversation where those of us in, you know, wealthy American cities where I am, can take lessons from people around the world who in some ways have much more experience with with significant loss of human life all at one time or you know catastrophic events reshaping the the landscape of life we've we've had that in the you know in the US and many of us have had that in our individual lives but this sort of wide scale suffering. Um, most of us in the first world have been fairly insulated from, but of course that's not true of everybody. There's always uh, a sense for people of a creative nature, uh, putting work out there to doubt the line of authenticity of what work they put out, right? In, in general, it doesn't matter whether you're writing something, whether it's a book or any piece of work. Um, in, does does these times affect that? Is that like an advantage that everyone's sort of hurting that this is a time to take advantage of certain situations, or is it the time to kind of like really process and 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 feel what's going through? Because like like you were saying at the start of the conversation, that different people are processing it in different ways, and there are some that don't know how to process or even to start to like. To process, and um, I, I wondered if there was like something that we, the, in in a sense of conversation, that we could actually help 
them or people that are kind of going, well, I, I wonder what kind of psychology I, I would have to change or have to like look at to help me through this time. Does it make sense? Yeah. I, I feel like I'm taking a lot of my cues from the psychology around grief that that for me is the big term that I am observing and not, I mean, grief, grief of course can be loss of life, but grief is also loss of plans, loss of businesses, loss of freedoms, lots of the ability to move around the world in the way that we had intended loss of the ability to hold each other. I mean, grief is, I think the sort of primary experience that, that many of us are sitting with and we do have lots of wisdom around grief. Like grief, grief has been happening since the beginning of humankind. Um, and we have wisdom around uh, corporate experiences of grief. So things like, you know, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa or Guatemala had a um sort of corporate process of talking about terrible things that happened that affected everybody. So when we're thinking about how to process grief, first and foremost, we have to be in the business of naming it, naming what's lost, naming what hurts, naming what we hoped had happened that won't happen now. And we, I think we have to do that in a really open-hearted way. Um, none of this, like, oh, someone else has it worse than me, none of this minimizing, none of this, but I'm fine. Just really open-heartedly saying, oh, I'm super sad that I'm not going to have baseball season or um, my daughter's not going to prom or, you know, I'm not going to see you in Savannah in a month. You know, all the things that have been lost, we must name. Um, and and I think that's fascinating. You talk about grief because I, even like I feel like I haven't necessarily been through entirely like grief what other people have been through because I still have my parents around and like that I I know I feel that that was going to be a big shift when um, I have to go through that kind of grief but I like you were saying like we all have ways of dealing with grief we've had we've had grief from the beginning of time but there's also the easy I suppose at the time the easy way to deal with grief is to like put it away and kind of go, it's fine. Um, and That's maybe the entrepreneurial way. Let's be honest. <laughs> keep moving, keep going. And I'm all for that too, right? Like just because you're in grief doesn't mean you roll over and, and die as well. So it's a both and, which is why I think this season is so hard for us because this is a season of grief and grief is quiet. Grief is dark. Grief is slow moving. It's not energetic and hyper. So we have to create these spaces within ourselves for this like slow sheltering, hunkering, pulling the blankets over our heads. And then we also have to create the space and the energy and the momentum within ourselves to keep moving and keep the world moving. So it's it's the both end of it that I think leaves a lot of us, especially the entrepreneurs among us, like a little bit lost. Like, am I supposed to be sad and grieving or am I supposed to be like charging through? And the answer is yes. <laughs> yes to both. Are you feeling unproductive during this time of crisis? Are you feeling guilty about not starting those projects that you said you would when you had time and now you have time, but you just can't bring yourself to start them? You're definitely not alone. In an article by the New York Times, productivity consultant and author of Hyperfocus, How to Manage Your Attention in a World of Distraction, Chris Bailey, encourages people not to be so hard on themselves during this pandemic stating that it's tough enough to be productive in the best of times, let alone when we're in a global crisis. The idea that we have so much time available during the day now is fantastic, but these days it's the opposite of a luxury. We're home because we have to be home and we have much less attention because we're living through so much. Well, that's not the best best answer for an entrepreneur because the entrepreneur wants to know which way is quicker, right? (laughs) Right. And of Um, course, neither are quick. (laughs) <laughs> right. And and you know what's really fascinating is um, the process right now, because what I've been saying for the last maybe week or so, and every time I say it, it feels more and more true, is like, 
I, I feel like we're ending the time of the masculine, the time of the feminine is beginning. And I, I feel like all those, like, even if you look at the patterns around us and the people that we talk to and the kind of stuff that, you know, that they're talking about, there's a lot more feeling involved rather than, you know, let's just get a goal and charge towards it, you know, breakthrough stuff and, and, and things like that. What do you reckon? How does that sound? Oh, what I does that so. sound like to you? <laughs> I hope so. I, it's a little hard for me to fully wrap myself around that hope Given that I live in a, a Trump presidency where, you know, it, it feels still quite divided. I think the masculine and the feminine that, that dwell within all of us, of course, these aren't relegated to roles of men and women. This is not sex no, no, or biology. Not. This is no, no. sort of um, the, the psyche, the spirit of us. I do think that the feminine is getting the, the reverence that, that she has long deserved. Um, but it's a hard fought battle, right? I think it's easier in some ways culturally for us to revert back to the masculine charge. And that's somewhat to our detriment. I mean, I think when we ignore the feminine or deny ourselves the emotional experience of grief, for example, we do an, some violence to our own selves in ways that do cost us. There's, there's, there's all these different elements that you know, we don't think about and we don't um, necessarily give enough time and space to. When when you think about like taking care of ourselves and, and you spoke about control uh, earlier on and that's a really good point. Like we control a lot of aspects like our body and stuff like that to keep, I, I never actually thought of it that way, but we do. And I think that I am okay with isolation because I I have controlled aspects. So that was really fascinating when you just said that and all the, the things that went through my brain. How are we meant to take care of ourselves? Because I feel like we can control that at the very least, right? Because if we could put our faith and hope and love and trust in anyone, why, w- why wouldn't it be ourselves? And if we did that, maybe everything else potentially could feel better uh, while we did that. What are your thoughts on that? Yes, I think in some ways, you know, we are, we are what we can most control. But I think for, for myself, maybe for you, for many of us, the, the most significant battlegrounds are also within us, right? It's so easy for that fear to kick over into something that's unhealthy. It's so easy for our moments of sadness to dive into depression. So yes, our most important intervention, I think, is in our self-care. It's in the tenderness towards ourselves, our ability to carefully attend to, gently, reverently, the emotional experience that's going on inside of us. Um, Certainly, the way that we do that is largely through caring for our bodies, our sleep, our food, our movement, um, mm-hmm. and then our attachments to the people to whom we, you know, either share space or share our hearts. So yeah. um, there are lots of things to be done that can help soothe our anxious souls in, you know, in very, in very um, helpful and meaningful ways. What are those like for someone listening? Like, what would we suggest them do? Like practically, because. I also know entrepreneurs and I put myself in that group feel guilty for taking time to to ourselves. Like that day that I had a down day, I was more upset that I was not getting stuff done because Mm -hmm. the event is getting closer Mm -hmm. than I was actually even paying attention to what was going on inside me. So um, what would you suggest for people? Yeah, super practically. um, Let yourself sleep as much as your body wants to sleep. Let like make sure your body moves every day significantly. So hopefully something that gets your heart rate up and then some stretching. When we take care of our bodies, we, you know, it's a dive down a different direction, but that's one of the best things that we can do for our mental health. Yeah. Um, I, I think especially during this time, it's really helpful to have some kind of creative project that demands our attention and focus um, but is somewhat separate from our businesses. So we've got a bunch of mutual friends who are who are uh, making sourdough bread. I've got friends that are brewing kombucha, um, friends who are working with woodwork. I'm building a garden on my roof, you know, things that are just require some mental energy and 
are different. They're a break from our business. They're a break from the news and the stories, but they can sort of give us an outlet where we feel like, oh, I can make something significant in the world. Um, I think another really practical thing is just making sure that we are staying really connected to the people in our lives. So one phone call a day, one Zoom date a day with someone just in your life that you care about to kind of refuel the, um, the coffers of relational connection is another really just practical tool. The main objective of this audio project is to bring together entrepreneurs and creatives who share similar values so that they can find the courage to put out their authentic voice for the right people to hear, which allows for them to make their impact on the world. Every great movement started with a memorable speech. For access to full-length interviews, go to psychologyofentrepreneurship.com and click the button. Uh, That's so helpful uh, because I think as well, no, I don't think I know that isolation has become easier because I've connected with so many people that normally I would connect with them once a year, which that's, that's not going to happen, but it'll happen virtually I hear, uh, which is exciting, but I, but not in person, of course. And, but I've connected with them more in these couple of months, you as well. Like, yeah. it's just, I, um, I'm actually enjoying the friendships that like for example Trevinia and Chris we had this conversation over a kitchen counter and I thought that was pretty cool so it's 6 a.m here I had to have this conversation with you and even um I think a couple of weeks ago we 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 caught up as well and and it has made a different kind of connection but connection nevertheless with which yeah I'm kind of noticing who I'm longing for like who I'm longing to talk to or who I'm longing to spend time with. And just the the noticing of that longing has been really lovely for me because I think, oh, like those are my people, like the midst of crisis, like this is who I want to chat with or this is whose face I want to see. So right. I think that tells you a lot about kind of your inner landscape when you're like, who am I longing for? Who do I just want to tell a story to or or hear a story from? What's, um, what's, what's, what's in your world? What's happening? I mean, I know you're seeing, you're still seeing patients. You're still, you're still working. You're, you've got kids you're taking care of. You've got th- their school. And here's what's really interesting. And I, I don't know whether I spoke with you about this because I've been saying this a lot more and more. Um, but I believe mothers to be the original entrepreneurs. And I was w- wondering what your take on that was because, Obviously, I'm a guy. I don't have kids. It's a weird thing to say. I have no necessarily perspective, except that I know that my mom was a chef, a cook, um, a driver, um, a hug giver, and, and everything else in between. And I know moms that do that and more uh, when they have a business and they have another baby, I suppose. Not to say that dads don't do it, but I feel like moms make this package that if package of value that is sent out into the world. And that's what, you know, business and entrepreneurship is. Curious on what you thought about that. So in, in lots of ways, I love it because it honors the, the very um, diverse skill set that goes into raising a small human, whether it's, whether it's moms or dads. And I do think that, that moms particularly are hustlers. Like I know for me, I, my days are 100% full now. I am busier than I was before and I don't leave the house, right? Because I'm homeschooling three children and keeping my business going and, you know, all of the other things like cleaning my own house which I haven't done in a long time, to be honest. So um, I think that the shadow side of that or the hard side, and we have quite a body of psychological research to support that women in families, even in fairly egalitarian families, do tend to carry a heavier mental load. So they are carrying more responsibility for thinking about matters of the household as well as tasks related to kids. We, we do see higher rates of, um, of depression, of a number of kind of distress-related mental illness kinds of 
cues among women, largely because like our lives don't stop and the load's pretty heavy. Again, not at all to negate the role of men, but I know a number of entrepreneurial families where maybe the male partner is the CEO of something and the female partner has a business, but it makes less or maybe has less influence because she's diversified her work life to account for children. And so during the COVID crisis, she's the one who's making more sacrifices to her job. It's logistic. It makes sense. It's logistically practical, but I think that mothers particularly are going to bear a different kind of burden uh, from this pandemic than, than other people. That's not a, that's not a woe is me statement. I think it's just probably pretty well born out in the social science research. (laughs) No, but it's it's fascinating because I had not thought of that. I I the, the when I thought of mental health and the mental health issues, I thought of uh, obviously uh, from a guy's perspective, I thought of like uh, dads who lost their jobs and suddenly can't feed their kids. Yeah. And I thought, oh my god, that's gonna that's gonna be a big spike from the six point six million that lost, you know, their jobs. Or in 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 India, who actually people live you know hand to mouth and had to walk mm-hmm. like because all transport is cut off in India as well. So they had to walk 200, 200 Ks or something to get home and, and things like that. But I had never considered that aspect. Um, I'd love for you to talk more about it so that we can understand it because it's actually literally the first time I'm thinking yeah. about that. Well, it's been a bit since I've read this research, but mental load is essentially in a number of things that you're carrying around in your mind, on your heart, the things that you're responsible for. So things like, um, do all of the children have the right size shoes for how, how fast they're growing? Um, yeah. Do we have leafy green vegetables in the house? Things that are not necessarily, they don't have to only be women's questions, but they, the default is that in most families they are. Yeah. Um, so even though maybe, again, traditional family, the, the male member of the family would be the breadwinner. And so the loss of a job is, of course, like it psychologically devastating. And I don't mean to minimize that at all. Um, Mm. But the other members of the family also feel that, and it often falls to the woman to sort of try to cushion the fall of that for everyone in the family. Yeah. And I think it's not even noticed either way. I don't know whether, I'm not even sure whether the, you know, the women even know that they're doing necessarily the extra caring, or if they are, they're not necessarily saying that it's a, it's a burden to them. I wonder whether that's the case. I mean, I'm just asking questions. Uh, I think they know. (laughs) I think they feel it. There was one of the first shows that I put that, that I helped launch was called the mompreneur show. And that was the first time I Mm kind of like had access to things that I never thought of before, like the balance and mother's guilt and and all that kind of stuff. And I wonder, especially with mother's guilt, going through something like that, how does one process that? How does then taking time for, for, for yourself is probably the thing that anyone would suggest, but that is like this vicious circle, it seems. Sure. Yeah. I think one of the challenges that all parents are facing right now is the sense in which there's, there's just not enough to go around. So if you are somebody who is, is lucky enough to still be working, but then also has kids at home, like I know for myself, I'm running late more often than normal. I'm less prepared for things that I've committed to. Um, I'm much less attentive to my children's schoolwork than I would like to be. Um, I've been microwaving a lot of things. So it's sort of like everything is is not quite fully cooked. Like everything is sort of at 80% capacity. You know, that's a B. It's okay. But I'm an A person, right? I'm a person who's like, no, I'm going to be totally ready. I'm going to totally prepare it. I'm going to be on time. I'm going to rock it. And the reality is that I and many, many parents alongside me are not rocking anything right now. We're just sort of like slogging through. And that takes its own toll. You just feel like, oh my goodness, like I don't even really know if my kid did his math today. I guess I'll go check, but I have to like do 18 things on the way to do that all of which may be of lesser quality than I'm used to because I'm distracted and there's just simply too many things on my plate right now. So I think that's really the challenge that many parents are experiencing as you are facing the challenges of homeschooling or, or just monitoring kids and then also trying to work. Yeah. And I think the being hard on ourselves is a, 
is a universal human thing. Like if there's no one else to blame, we just blame ourselves. Um, and then we right. beat ourselves up about it. <laughs> and, and that <laughs> comes to being like, you know, the A, because I, I for sure have been late to meetings recently, which I'm not usually. Mm-hmm. I've missed meetings. Like I had a meeting with Tucker on, on Saturday and I thought it was eight o'clock my time, but it was at seven o'clock. So at eight o'clock, I go to click the link and it's like, it's already done. Uh, I beat myself up about it. Yeah. And then luckily I'm quicker at catching it these Mm -hmm. days, but I acknowledge that there are obviously things that we are not aware that we're processing or putting away maybe. Sure. Um, And it's coming out in different ways that normally wouldn't thought. Yeah. I think one of the things that I'm, really mindful of in my own family and then in the conversations with entrepreneurs all over the world that I'm having is frankly just our uptick in alcohol use, right? Like the, you know, you're home, you've been kind of trapped all day and it feels so much easier to just pour that second, third drink at the end of the day. And I'm definitely not someone who villainizes alcohol. I think they're perfectly can be lots of ways to have healthy relationships with alcohol. But I think during this, this time when we are already feeling that way that you describe, like it's so easy to beat up on ourselves, even in really subtle ways that we're trying to turn down that feeling of self-criticism as well as the feeling about, you know, global anxiety with things that sort of numb or dull our senses. And so, you know, I think that's one of the things that I'm quite worried about as this unfolds and as it goes longer, that people like us who are used to being able to kind of like rally and perform pretty well, that sort of slide into self-medication because we see ourselves not the way we want to be is potentially pretty dangerous. When you say it like that, that sounds like all my friends. Yeah. You know, all your friends too. Like it's just, um, and it happens so often that we we are so critical on ourselves in general for not performing to certain standards that we have set for ourselves in our heads, but then we, we, we almost punish ourselves, you know, going forward. What other trends are you seeing in the way things are going down? And, and especially for like, because obviously we're, we're going to hurt from a health perspective and which we are currently, and then we're going to mm-hmm. hurt from a, you know, financial, economical perspective, but we're going to hurt from a mental health perspective is going to be probably the, like, wow, that's, I, I acknowledge that that's going to be big. Um, what trends are you seeing and what can we, can we prepare for anything? Yeah. I think, you know, when you apply pressure, all of the cracks are going to split open. So I think we're going to really some families will really struggle. I think we'll see um, some marriages come to an end. We'll see some post quarantine separations where people are like, I can't, I can't be in the same space as you right now. Um, I do think we're, we run the risk of seeing, seeing ourselves be much harder on our children than is necessary. And whether it's the extent, extension of our own need for control that we're putting on them and putting pressure on them to be, you know, high performing homeschoolers or whatever it is that there's also this increase in irritability that goes along with depression, that goes along with anxiety, that goes along with substance use, which often is directed at the most, most vulnerable, but also to be honest, like most irritating members of the family, which are usually the small kids. You know, if we look at trends that are potential liabilities, again, alcohol use, problems in in intimate relationships, uh, challenges with kids, being more harsh in our discipline, being more shaming, being more critical. And then, of course, good old-fashioned anxiety and depression, which many of us are battling on a good day, and then add to it this extra set of pressures. And, you know, I think we'll see some people struggle. If you're self-isolating with your partner and are finding yourself feeling overwhelmed or irritated by their presence, here are a few tips from an article posted by Raquel Peel on The Conversation to help try and maintain a healthy relationship throughout this pandemic. Monitor the ratio between your positive and negative interactions. 
Make a new routine with your partner to fit around working at home and family commitments at home. This routine needs to include quality couple time, as well as some time apart. Give each other time to work on individual hobbies and take it in turns looking after the kids or other family members at home. Reassure your partner of their safety. Have a conversation about what safety means to both of you and how you can plan to keep yourselves and other family members in the household safe. Make plans with your partner for after the crisis. Planning can help to keep you positive and motivated to stay safe. If you can, use this time to practice healthier habits such as eating well, sleeping, exercising and practicing mindfulness. These things improve mental well-being and if done together can help build intimacy. There's also, you know, of course, a long history of correlation, um, co-occurrence between financial crises and financial problems and suicides, completed suicides, especially among men. So that's another thing that I think we'll have to be really, really mindful of as as we go further into this story. Yeah. And, and things are changing so quickly. I have not consumed the news uh, in, I don't know, 17, 18 years maybe, but Every morning I, I check uh, the BBC homepage and I check Sydney Morning Herald. And only because, to be honest, I, I don't even know which version of the news is right anymore. It's so <laughs> annoying. And it's hard even to like predict or process or understand the things that are going down. Like, especially when, like if I walk into a store here in Australia, for example, we've got everything. There's nothing. There's nothing short. It's fresh vegetables, everything is available, but then it's different in other places. And yeah. we still have buses running, you know, doing their thing. And it's not the same in other places. And um, especially people who have fought for their country and we, you know who I'm talking about and have now suddenly feel restricted because they don't have the freedom they fought for. Mm-hmm. That seems, it seems like everyone's edges are being pushed up against. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's being, yeah. Yeah, which will reveal all the vulnerabilities. It will also reveal all the strengths, right? It's always the both and. So when we're put under pressure, um, there are parts of us that shine, right? I feel so much more tenderness and compassion towards my fellow human right now. And I just, I just live in that place of open heartedness. And it's, it's beautiful. I see it in other people too. I, you know, I think there's so much beauty to be seen, but of course, right alongside that are, are all the ways in which different parts of us are going to shatter. You were talking about tenderness and compassion and I actually wrote that down because genuinely don't necessarily know how to, maybe, maybe I exercise it, but I don't know how to recognize it, but also maybe I don't know how to exercise it. How would you, what would you suggest for someone like myself? Because like when I think about tenderness and compassion, I think about, you know, hugging someone, but now in a time of, of a, a virtual environment, how does that work? And how, how does one, first of all, be tender and compassionate towards themselves, but then also, um, you know, find ways to be that to other people? Yeah, I think, I think it starts with a check-in both internally and interpersonally, right? The check-in is, how am I? How's my heart? How's my energy? How's my thought life? And the same kinds of questions for people in your life. Hey, how are you? How's your heart? What's going on? What are you struggling with? What's bringing you joy? You know, they're the same questions that we ask in friendship. I think now we're just asking them much more intentionally, Um, I think an added layer though, is this sense of like helpfulness and altruism that many of us have not been deeply connected to how powerful we are to be present in other people's lives or even to provide really practical help. Um, you know, like I paid for a bunch of private sessions with my favorite yoga teacher just because I know that this guy needs the cash and it's like, "Ah, I'll cash in like, you know, I'll see you in November, whatever. But like, there are lots of little ways that I know you're doing. And I know many people who are listening to this are doing because you're just thinking like, who's, who's struggling and what resources do I have that might be helpful? So that's the tenderness and compassion. It's, it's internal. It's the check-in and then it's the, what do I need? 
What do you need? What does the world need? Well, Dr. Sherry Walling, this has always been, it's always a pleasure. Um, do you like when I call you Dr. Sherry Walling? I like it. That I, is I, my it, name. I, <laughs> Go yeah, ahead. <laughs> yeah. Um, it sounds, um, it makes my podcast a bit more legitimate when I have a Dr. <laughs> Sherry Walling. <laughs> the doctor's yeah. here. Yeah. The doctor's here. It's, it's interesting to, to have a doctorate degree in a time like this. <laughs> yes, I think it's, I mean... This is an aside, but I think any of that is such an exercise in humility, right? You dive deep into something only to discover how much deeper it is and how much more there is to learn. So I'm grateful for my training and I'm really glad that I committed my mind to the sort of discipline of study, but also (laughs) I'm just getting started. Like I'm no expert, right? I'm just, I just have read a lot of books and had a lot of, uh, Great, great teachers help me learn how to think. Well, I suppose that's the case with, with 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 most of us that go into any sort of discipline. We realize how much every time we learn something, we realize how much more there is to learn, mm-hmm. and how much we are not necessarily a guru or the teacher, but just a student of the whole thing. And um, how cool is that? Well, especially the human experience, right? It's infinitely complicated, and never straightforward. I mean, sometimes it's straightforward, but rarely. And yeah. so it makes it uh, both like a delight to spend my life jumping in and experimenting and watching and learning and mm. uh, infinitely humbling. Well, like always, this is just a slice of heaven to spend any time with you. So um, thank you for doing this. It's, it's my first uh, virtual uh, interview for psychology. Um, ah. So let's see, um, because they've all been done in person and, and, um, obviously we can't do that going forward, but, um, and I'm running out of interviews and everyone's like, Hey, what are we going to do going forward? But it, it, one of the things that we get, um, a lot of feedback about is, is your volume. So, um, thank you for, for being such a huge contributor to the psychology of entrepreneurship for sure. Oh, it's my pleasure. I love that you are hosting these conversations because I feel like these are the conversations that need to be had, especially now. Yeah, right. Um, well, I'm glad I have a platform to be able to do it. And it's uh, it's always a, a pleasure to have conversations, especially with, you know, it's the energy exchange that happens. That's, that's always kind of cool. Absolutely. Psycho. Coming up on The Psychology of Entrepreneurship. The entire world is quarantined right now due to COVID-19 and we're all struggling with that in different ways. For some families, isolation isn't a new concept. In Chicago, police saw an almost 10% increase in domestic violence calls just for the week of March 16th to 22nd. Every single day was filled with overwhelming fear. So how do we help those who may be experiencing isolation in more dire situations than our own? Don't be afraid to let someone know how you need help or that you need help at all. We're all in this together. Until next week, happy isolating. This is a Must Amplify production. Special thanks to every guest expert that has appeared on the show. Voiceovers, editing and sound design by Kelly Bonnyman. Guest research and content by Claire Gould and Corin Castles. Project managed by Kelly Bonnyman. Produced and hosted by me, Ronsley Buzz. For more episodes and where to listen, go to mustamplify.com slash P-O-E. Hey, it's Kaylee from Must Amplify. I'm the sound engineer for this volume of Psychology of Entrepreneurship. I'm part of the team that made this production come alive. I work as a part of a global team with our studios based in West End, Brisbane, Australia. If you would like a podcasting checklist, email me at kaylee at amplifyagency.media. That's K-A-I-L-I at amplifyagency.media. We specialize in finding your voice and making sure it's heard by the right people. If you are considering whether a podcast is a good idea for your business, check out our other show on shouldistartapodcast.com. Are you still listening? Here's a little gift to you for sticking around. 
we have been safe. Uh, we have take two because Kelly is so demanding.